uh, has come to the forefront. So uh, just uh, wanted to share uh, some of those, uh, those items. I have a agenda, so let me actually start sharing my screen first. I hope you can see my screen, Dave. Yes. Yeah, we sure can. That looks good. Yeah. So just a quick uh, intro about myself. Uh, colleagues who attended my last session, perhaps uh, they have some reference to my background. Uh, unlike many of you, my specialization is not audit compliance, um, but, uh, you know, I've been into this space for almost 15 years or so, but my uh, real uh, value that I've added uh, is from a data science perspective. My specialization is applying these data science technologies, uh, data science processes uh, to you know, compliance and risk management issues. It just happens to be the case that from the last 10 or 15 years or so, I've been applying these principles to cybersecurity issues. In particular, when I was at Black Tuck, uh, we were responsible for open source risk management and at Teach Lab, uh, the company I started back uh, in 2018 19 timeframe after Black Tuck was acquired by Synopsys uh, on API risk management related, related issues. You can read more about, uh, about myself and the background from my LinkedIn profile. I'm happy to connect with uh, with you and share some more thoughts uh, beyond this uh, this session. Uh, but let's just go to the agenda, what we want to do this uh, together. If you attended my first session, perhaps you may recall, my focus was mainly on APIs and the ecosystem that is evolving at the global level and how enterprises are facing some of those challenges. And uh, the basic theme of my today's presentation remains the same, which is API risk management and how do we uh, build a risk management program for enterprises uh, to, uh, to manage API risks, in particular, uh, translating the API security issues to the business risk. And we'll see some examples. But today, the addition I want to have and I share some thoughts uh, still again in the context of APIs is from AI perspective. And since uh, I would say last five years or so, uh, APIs have become more intelligent, more uh, autonomous in the sense that there is a lot of intelligence and uh, automation provided by these systems. So uh, AI has added additional uh, additional constraints from a risk management perspective. A lot of companies are embedding these APIs that are driven by AI and, and the corresponding intelligence. So there are newer kinds of risks uh, that, that I want to highlight, and we'll see some of those examples. And uh, for Dave's recommendation and another colleague's uh, request, I will try to add some, some demos at the end to connect the concepts that we'll review together and uh, try to relate it back to some of those issues, uh, uh, you know, uh, through my demonstration. I don't mind you ask me question as we proceed. Uh, Dave, I'm not sure if you allow uh, colleagues to ask the questions through just Q&A or if they are able to unmute themselves and ask questions live. I don't mind either of those modes. I'm okay with uh, anybody asking the question during the presentation. Uh, don't feel uh, to interrupt me and ask those questions. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to take pause and, uh, and answer those questions as we move along. It seems that we have some additional buffer time towards the end. So I think we, we don't need to rush. Yeah, and, and I would just encourage anybody initially, if you post the questions in the chat, 
and then if it makes sense to figure uh to unmute and stuff like that we can do that um i'll have to figure out how to do it uh <laughs> but <laughs> if it comes to that but i know i've got i know how, how how i can manage the chat effectively so excellent just give me give me one second sure Just real quick, we wait for Dr. Baljeet. Um, just out of curiosity, if you can post in the chat, if you did have the opportunity uh, to attend um, the presentation that he had for us last year, or if this is new for everybody. All right, I'm back. Sorry, Dave, were you uh, explaining some something to the audience? I, I was just um, asking if, for people to share if they were able, if this is the first time they're hearing from you or if they were able to attend uh, the session from last year. And uh, most people are posting that uh, this is uh, new for them, so. Okay, excellent. So I'm glad that uh, uh, colleagues will benefit from some of the old content that I will share. Uh, but as I said, my focus will be a lot on the on the AI technologies being embedded uh, in the APIs in the API ecosystem, and I will also share some of the thoughts from a legal point of view. What kind of initiatives governments are taking all around the world uh, to to govern the usage of some of these technologies? So let's get started. The very first thing. Of course, I want to touch upon is uh, I'm sure everybody knows APIs. I, they, they don't need they don't they don't need to understand. Uh, but just to refresh your thoughts, my focus here is on the uh, web APIs uh, that are available as a service over the internet as a SOAP or as a REST service, responding back a JSON uh, object or data. Essentially, they empower all kinds of digital applications. As shown on this uh, particular slide, you know, this could be an app that is calling another app. Uh, you know, for example, an app calling Google Maps API to uh, show some of the navigation capabilities or a marketing product fetching social media feeds from Twitter or social uh, media platforms like Facebook, uh, adding some uh, some sentiment analysis capabilities or the reviews or people's profile and whatnot. And this way, uh, APIs are all around us. Any application you pick, you have applications pulling up weather data or uh, you know information about logistics or, as I mentioned, weather or people's profile. They're all around us. And uh, this picture tries to depict this digital economy in which we live today, in which enterprise applications are connected to, uh, you know, uh, ERPs or social media platforms. Uh, all these applications need to be connected for various business and technical functionalities. The new addition we see that has attracted all of our attention is uh, generative AI capabilities. Uh, the example I've highlighted in this connected network is chat GPT or open, a open AI APIs that are adding value from, you know, natural language processing capabilities or even uh, audio and video capabilities. For example, you know, you give a prompt and, you know, AI systems can generate a small clip or a picture or a visual. And many enterprise applications all around us are using many of these technologies. And now you can start to think about, uh, they are no longer, there are no longer issues around just, you know, security, but also a huge aspect around compliance. Many of these AI technologies are uh, making decisions that are empowering businesses from various perspectives. And governments all around the world, they are worrying about how some of these AI technologies are impacting their uh, public services or the rights of the citizens. Are these applications biased or are these applications making any decisions that could 
fundamentally affect the rights of their citizens. Of course, uh, governments are, want to promote their ecosystems, leveraging upon these AI technologies. It is just a matter of time, pretty much, uh, you know, all aspects of our digital, uh, you know, lives have these different components enabled through AI technologies. Uh, but again, in terms of the processes, in terms of the laws, uh, regulations, you know, we are still lacking some, uh, some advancements. AI technologies are already being embedded, but it's just that we have to find interesting ways to govern them. I will share some of the initiatives from the US perspective, from a Canadian perspective, and also as well as EU perspective as well. And this is happening uh, all across different businesses in different sectors and different industries. Uh, nothing is untouched. Either the these are retail sectors or energy sector, or even engineering and uh, industries uh, that uh, that uh, empower our infrastructure, power plants, and and uh, corresponding industries, public services. So each API that you imagine or envision is very much like a asset that is embedded in your digital ecosystems that is essentially providing access to data. Without getting into too many technical details, you can see every API essentially enables that, uh, uh, that access to data that is being fetched from different information systems. You know, to, to enable a product or a function or a feature in a, any particular application. The challenges are these APIs are also prone to various kinds of attacks. At the end of the day, these APIs are transacting data and bad actors would love to uh, access those data either to expand their attack surface or these data themselves are very valuable to them, which, uh, you know, which, which is with the which is the reason why they're attacking these systems. And these are some of the uh, real examples from the recent years in which uh, you can see all kinds of applications have been attacked. Either they are mobile networks or uh, applications that are tracking people's medical records or even social media platforms. And the, the common thread across these different problems that I'm highlighting is APIs, you know, these compromises happened because, you know, APIs were not secure enough or uh, bad actors were able to exploit those APIs and access to the data that they were not supposed to access. Yeah. This is we, so... We, we, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but we do have a question from Dorothy uh, in the chat. Um, is the API stored on the client workstation or the cloud? It depends on uh, application to application, but in many of the cases, the reason why companies are building those APIs are they want to create an ecosystem around their APIs. Let's talk. Let's uh, look at the example of Twitter APIs or other other uh, uh, platforms. So, of course, Twitter has a value as a SMS service for the internet. A lot of the data that is being produced on that platform is very valuable to a lot of companies around the world for product reviews, understanding people's background, their thoughts, and so on and so forth. So Twitter has built these APIs through which you can fetch those tweets coming from different regions, from different people, talking about different stuff. And that is a very, very valuable resource. Now to answer Dorothy's question with this background, Essentially, Twitter will build these APIs as a publicly facing APIs that are hosted in the cloud. And they would want these developers or applications or enterprises to access those APIs to integrate into their own applications, which creates value for them. And of course, you know, there could be a monetization strategy, there could be a, a, an integration strategy, all kinds of, uh, you know, strategies might be there for them to build these APIs at first place. And of course, uh, you know, this is this is the story of 
APIs that are publicly available. But that's not always the case because you may, as a company, want to build certain APIs that are private to you and your customers and partners. But a lot of times, just like software became open source, APIs are by nature are built to have that openness so that the, the digital ecosystems can go around them to create more opportunities. Uh, at the end of the day, as I mentioned, APIs are nothing but transacting data, very much similar to like websites. Uh, but APIs by nature are built for machine to machine communication to provide intelligence, to provide that automation. So Dorothy, to answer your question, it really depends on the underlying business, the strategy, the goal that you want to have around your API ecosystem, and what you want to achieve those th uh, through those APIs. So you can host them accordingly, either locally, in the cloud, on-prem, or even local uh, in your workstations. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, if there are any additional questions, uh, please, Dave, uh, feel free to pause me. I'm happy to answer again. Right on. Yep, you got it. This problem around API breaches have uh, gone so much so far that within the la within this year up to January, millions of records have been stolen. And this picture is not necessarily summarizing uh, only the API specific breaches, but to share with you, 85% of the internet traffic is through APIs or so, 83% or so. You know, I'm just rounding this number to 85. Now, what does this mean, uh, uh, you know, from a, from a philosophical point of view? If 85% of the internet traffic is through APIs, which means all the data that you be that you see being transacted over the internet is through APIs, then these APIs are the prime attack surface for the bad actors. And all your records, you know, customer data, your uh, uh, pricing information, this is all valuable information, student records, employee records, these are all transacted through APIs. And it would not be uh, untrue or hypothetical to say that many of these records that are being stolen perhaps have happened because of these compromised APIs. So uh, moving forward, protecting these APIs are very much uh, uh, important aspect of application security programs of these enterprises. And uh, uh, in theory, you can see that if this is true, if this number is true globally, you know, this trickle downs to all the enterprises as well, correct? And uh, believe it or not, thousands of APIs could be part of your organization. Some could be internal, some could be external, some could be free, some could be paid, some could be provided by partners, some could be built by you. So it's, it's a massive ecosystem that is evolving within enterprises. Forget about an enterprise. I've seen firsthand cases in which uh, APIs in thousands in one single product. You know, Of course, it depends on what that product does. Many of the applications these days are cloud native applications. And they need to be connected as shown in this example or in this slide. So you can expect thousands and thousands of API integrations across your enterprise. Now, of course, this is not true for every organization. A smaller organization may have a smaller set of APIs, but I think you get the point. If you want to read that point, more, if you don't mind, just, just to that point, and it's not a question, but if it's a smaller organization, they very well could be more dependent on other third-party APIs that they're not aware of or have less control over. Absolutely. And that is a huge problem. And you are absolutely right, Dave, because how many applications you can develop internally? It, there is a limit, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, you depend on innovations that are happening outside your organization. And you do not necessarily want to reinvent the wheel. 
And that's where APIs have become such an important mechanisms uh, or digital assets where you can integrate a, a new feature or new function seamlessly without writing a huge piece of code or application with by just calling that API with few lines of code inside your application, fetching the data from a third party, embedding in your workflow, achieving a business or a technical functionality, and, and moving on with the new product or a new function. That, that is the future of software applications moving forward. And we will continue to see this, uh, you know, this, this ecosystem evolve uh, to have perhaps millions of APIs. Uh, if some of you, uh, Dave, you might remember if uh, from my previous presentation, I had another slide, which I did not necessarily include in this one, where we're talking about how APIs are growing year by year. And it's just a matter of time, we'll see them into millions and perhaps billions because IoT, AI, smart homes, smart vehicles, smart devices, smart wearables, wherever there is a data that needs to be connected, it has value for somebody. Wow. Companies want to monetize them. You want to benefit from them. You know, you will see this connectedness. So you will see that ecosystem evolving uh, in a very interesting way. Anyways, coming back to this, uh, uh, this slide here, if you want to read more about how to protect your APIs, uh, OWASP, which is another uh, organization like ISA ISACA, uh, but of course their focus is more on application security. I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with them. So they have, since 2019, they have recommended uh, OWASP top 10 uh, best, you know, uh, practices or problems that that are attacking those those API ecosystems, and you want to address them. Authentication, authorization, being uh, some of the top problems, uh, and you can read more about them. You know by going to OWASP's uh, website. But since my focus is more on risk management, which essentially means that we know that APIs, when they are designed or you are integrating from the third party uh, services, we will continue to have security issues with them. You know, like any other product in the world, APIs are not going to be perfect, all the way from design to the way they are being deployed in the cloud, even though it's just a, a, a URI you invoke inside your application, but we will continue to see these problems. Authentication will be broken, access controls, or authorization problems will be there, or these APIs by nature uh, will have the uh, injection problems. For example, API in many ways, there is an input, there is an output. So those, those inputs can be manipulated to fuzz with the APIs and, and make the APIs behave differently, which could break your workflow or, or, or even worse, bring the entire service down. But you can read more about such problems uh, directly from OWASP's website. My focus moving forward is how many of such problems will actually translate to business issues. For example, if many APIs have authentication authorization problems, but do they lead to the same business risk? The answer is no. Even though many APIs may have the same authentication authorization technical issue, but it really depends on what those APIs are doing, what kind of data they are transacting, and therefore their business risk will translate differently. But before I go there, let me talk about what I promised uh, initially to talk about what is the relationship between AI and APIs and give you an example, you know, how this is adding additional dimension to risk management moving forward. So let's talk about that. Now, nobody needs a lesson on AI. I think everybody is hyped up about, uh, you know, using, utilizing artificial intelligence uh, in various products and services within their organizations, even though if they are not dealing within their organization as part of their day-to-day -day job, I'm sure in their personal capacity, they are already using a lot of tools that are empowered by AI. You know, uh, our children or younger generation are using 
a lot of audio video uh, applications where they are creating these emojis or funny faces or creating uh, you know different video uh, clips uh, empowered by some of these applications on the enterprise side you know there are image recognition apis detecting uh, brain cancer as a matter of fact just very recently in canada a government has approved a pilot program to use ai to assist the practitioners with a mammographic test to detect breast cancer and uh, i'm sure many of you can give other types of examples uh, from a finance uh, industry or banking industry where ai is being used for mortgage applications screening or in the recruitment uh, industry or in the job industry you know uh, professionals are using uh, ai to sort out uh, you know relevant resumes or applicants to different kinds of uh, job uh, jobs that are out there so you name any industry, AI is making a huge impact. Uh, I forgot to mention another important industry, uh, which is the legal services uh, or the law firms that are providing uh, various uh, legal advisory services. A lot of uh, a lot of the agreement analysis can actually be done through through uh, this intelligence. Uh, but of course, uh, the goal there is not to replace the lawyers or medical practitioners. Or uh, or other professionals, but slowly, you know, this is empowering them to make uh, uh, more effective decisions. And it is not untrue, and unfortunately, that is uh, it is uh, it is the state of the art that this will replace many jobs. A lot of the automation uh, that that will achieve the day to day jobs uh, or the functions that we perform uh, through assistance. Uh, with our own skills will be replaced by this automation engines uh, gen through generative AI. So hopefully that helped you understand, you know, AI is pretty much being embedded everywhere. But I think one, one explanation that still begs description is what's the relationship between AI and APIs? So for the lack of uh, better words and uh, lack of visualization, I I try to be a bit creative here and give a simple example in which I'm showing the relationship through this uh, plumbing example, uh, where in many cases you do, you you have never digged into how the fresh water comes to you. You don't care about it actually, unless until you your systems break down. So you can think the relationship between AI and APIs in a similar way, where all you care is, can I have the, the service of either processing an image or uh, getting a generative response, depending on the prompt, from an AI system. All of that gut is hidden from you, and you don't actually see what is happening. Let's talk about OpenAI or ChatGPT example. Now you can embed ChatGPT capabilities through an API call inside your application. But ChatGTP is not delivering the data models to you, their software, all the training, all the system that has gone back into building that intelligence. All you care is, there is this is the, the question, I want an answer. And that answer can be delivered to to an API integration. So in many ways, you can see this relationship, you can see this analogy where many applications around the world will embed these technologies where they have uh, mined uh, terabytes of data and expose some of the intelligence they have extracted through that AI or machine learning or data mining capabilities and expose those capabilities through APIs. So in summary, AI remains your backend system and API becomes a vehicle to deliver that intelligence. And uh, this is happening all around the world. I gave the example of chat GPT, but you can you can now extrapolate that to many, many applications around the around different industries. Either it's mapping services, they will become not just 
provide you data navigation, but they will provide intelligence, you know, accident information, congestion information. A lot of those intelligence would come, uh, you know, just by embedding those capabilities and delivered to APIs. And unfortunately, the governments um, are, are moving on this, but a bit slow. You know, as I mentioned in my several examples, we already see those applications all around us in our personal capacity, in our professional capacity, uh, but governments are waking up to this challenge now. And uh, they are enacting certain laws that are specifically dedicated to AI technologies. So in the next few slides, I want to review what are some of these initiatives in the US, in Canada, uh, in U EU. And let me start with the, with the US uh, case study. And uh, here, perhaps uh, all of you are aware of the executive orders that are passed by the president on time to time basis to address key challenges. You know, very recently they came up with the cybersecurity mandate and previously they came up with the executive order on promoting artificial intelligence. Um, you'll be surprised, actually it's not surprise, surprising to me uh, there is no AI specific law yet enacted in the US, but that is not to say there are no other laws that actually govern the usage of some of these technologies. We, ha we have seen many data specific laws, privacy laws that are essentially rooted in the usage of data. And you can see that they somehow uh, also overlap or provide some sort of framework to govern the usage of AI services. At the end of the day, AI is leveraging upon those large volumes of data to build those services. So there is there is some uh, some framework there, uh, but uh, there is no specific law in the U.S. at least to the best of my knowledge that is that is targeting AI applications. But in Canada, the story is different. We are. Currently, uh, uh, in the Canadian uh, Parliament, debating, which is called Bill C-27. It is a bill, which means that it is still uh, being vetted in the Parliament, but it's just a matter of time, it will become a law in Canada. And here you can see that it has different parts, but part three of this Bill C-27 actually specifically targets artificial intelligence area. And it is actually called Artificial Intelligence and Data Act. And the goal here is to build a framework uh, to govern the usage of AI technologies. Of course, it's mainly applicable uh, to, uh, to the Canadian companies or the companies that are providing services in Canada. But because of the, uh, the, the, the strong relationship between uh, the US and Canada, I'm sure many of these companies eventually will have to be compliant with these Canadian laws as well, as long as they're providing these services. In Europe, specifically in, uh, in uh, EU, uh, European Union, uh, they are actually one step ahead of us, both the US and Canada. They actually already have a law. Uh, some of you may might, uh, some of you may already know about this. So it is called EU AI law, and uh, they started working on this since 2021. And the, this is already something they have passed. They are giving some runway for companies to be compliant. I don't exactly know the exact dates, but I think this is already, uh, uh, this is already uh, there, but it will, they will start enforcing it, uh, you know, you know, either this year or early next year. But companies will have some time to be compliant uh, with these uh, EU laws. And just like Canada and the US, because of our stronger ties with EU nations, uh, specifically on the business uh, side uh, and uh, public to public contacts, we will see many, many organizations, companies around the world will eventually have to uh, be compliant and deliver on these guidelines. Now, let me talk about some of the specific areas identified 
by uh, these laws and regulations, which you want to keep in mind. And I'm sure many of you might be dealing with many of these applications within your organizations that are specifically under the radar of these laws. The first one at the top of my list is biometric applications. You know, anything that uses your uh, fingerprints, your, uh, your, uh, your other kinds of body vital signs, for example, your, uh, your uh, eye uh, prints uh, or other kinds of biometric uh, uh, signatures. And we, we see this already in many applications where they are using biometrics as an, a way to authenticate, to give you access to certain applications. And uh, they are classified as high-risk applications as long as they're using any kind of biometric uh, signatures. Similarly, if applications are dealing with law enforcement, for example, if uh, any aspect of uh, individual profiling includes some AI technologies to leverage upon the publicly available data for the purpose of law enforcement, or even situations like um, uh, uh, management of borders or uh, where you need to enforce the law. Uh, and in such applications, AI is being embedded, they are under the radar. Similarly, critical infrastructure. I asked them, one of my colleagues who is currently uh, in the role of evaluating um, any applications that enter EU market. So he represents EU body, which is responsible for auditing some of these applications. I asked him, what's the definition of critical infrastructure? And uh, anything that goes under supporting your financial services, for example, banks, power plants, uh, anything that basically is the backbone of a country from a digital uh, ecosystem perspective, they're all classified under critical infrastructure. Any services that deal with uh, essential services, for example, ambulances, uh, fire, fire uh, services, or policing services, they're all classified high-risk services under this category. Anything to do with educational, vocational training that essentially uh, enable a, um, any country's population to acquire different uh, job opportunities. You know, they are classified as um, high-risk AI services. And you can see that a lot of schools actually, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I teach uh, whenever I can in some of the universities in Canada and in the U.S., and I'm seeing a lot of the AI technologies being embedded in evaluations, uh, not just evaluation of the student grading, their assignments, but also for detecting plagiarism and things like that. And there are huge implications. Uh, students themselves, we are trying to formulate policies. What are the boundaries in which they can use some of the AI technologies for them to do their own assignments? Uh, it is still debatable. Some academic institutes are taking more rigid approach. Some are taking a bit flexible approach. Uh, who's right, who's wrong? I'm not necessarily in a position to comment on that. Uh, but you know, it really depends on the underlying infrastructure you're providing and what kind of philosophy you have adopted and how do you want your academic staff uh, how much they are empowered themselves to use some of these technologies uh, to administer uh, some of those exams and 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 uh, and services. It's just a matter of time. <clears throat> we will see a similar kind of technologies being embedded in uh, uh, in other professional training services. For example, ISACA runs you know various training programs, uh, ISSA, OWASP, and many of the professional bodies run various kinds of programs. It's just a matter of time, we'll start using some of these AI technologies uh, to enable that kind of training programs. You will see we as a company, uh, you know, that helps with API management and risk management, you know, we are using some of the AI technologies 
as part of our own service. So it's all around us. Any applications that has to do deal with, you know, migration, border control, asylum, uh, these are very important national security issues. You can, as you can imagine. Uh, so anywhere, any of these applications that deal with such applications, uh, you know, they are high risk uh, applications as well. Anything to do with employment, HR, uh, payroll services are also high risk training uh, or applications uh, that are under radar. Last but not the least, any application that deals with administration of justice system, uh, delivering justice to courts. Uh, there is a funny, not funny so, but now it has become serious. Uh, in one of the US courts, one of the judges actually used chat GPT to use, to summarize the, the case, uh, to identify different stakeholders in the case. I mean, it's just, it, it makes sense. Uh, it may not make sense in many cases, but wherever you need some assistant in uh, uh, assistance in summarizing a large document or large uh, sets of uh, statements, I think uh, uh, AI, generative AI, leveraging upon some of these natural language capabilities could be very, very powerful. In summary, if you are dealing with any of these applications as an auditor, as a as a as a pro program manager, or as a, a compliance uh, officer, uh, or even being part of these uh, product teams who are developing these applications, then pay attention to these applications because any of these applications, if they are entering as of today, European uh, Union region. Uh, they are identifying, they are being identified as high risk applications. And especially if they are using any components related to AI. And this could be a simple API that is integrated to provide authentication using one of these biometric uh, signatures I'm talking about. You know, they must be audited, they must be uh, in a position to demonstrate that they are meeting EU regulations. Same thing will happen uh, in Canada sooner or later, or as a matter of fact, uh, in the US, if you're dealing with feds, they are already have some guidelines under the cybersecurity executive order that came in, I believe in 2021, which talks about providing bill of materials, which, which where you have to list all the third party applications that are empowering some of these uh, capabilities. Hey, we do have, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of comments or a question and a comment uh, in the chat uh, from one from Dorothy. What would AI do with a specific biometric from thousands of different people? What would AI do in the context of biometric for thousands of users? I'm I'm just trying to I'm ref, I'm trying to rephrase the question so that I I better understand this. Sure, sure. And, and Dorothy, even if you can add any additional context to that, it, it might be helpful to make sure we're telling you the right thing. Um, yeah. And then, and, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. And if I can uh, if I can rephrase again, so I think um, this is happening. Uh, in many places, for example, if you call your mobile company, then they give you an offer, then, then they offer you to record your voice. So the next time when you call them, you don't have to punch in your password and things like that. Now, imagine a typical mobile company has millions of customers. And uh, these voice samples they are collecting, they're using some sort of data model uh, to recognize you as an individual. So it's a matter of privacy. And also, uh, I'm, for sure, they're using AI technology to enable that authentication. So to answer your question, Dorothy, um, that is the, a typical use case of AI. And the way they will integrate these technologies with the applications to which you will call them back 
are your mobile applications where there will be an API that is actually enabling that authentication, you know, collecting a voice sample, sending it back to their server where the authentication takes place based on the voice sample they have recorded. So, uh, so that is a, a, a prime example of a biometric uh, signature used for thousands of different people to enable a service. And I'm sure for them, for the company to build such a service, uh, they are leveraging upon various samples upon which they have trained their systems. And it may not be the mobile company that has built this. Maybe this is Google who has providing them this authentication service. You know, Google has built a lot of interesting speech processing APIs, image recognition APIs. Microsoft perhaps is doing the same thing. Uh, so my point is, doesn't really matter who is doing this. Point A, these are AI technologies. Point B, they are trained on hundreds of thousands of samples taken from hundreds of thousands of people, and they are recording those biometric samples for hundreds and perhaps millions of their customers. Yeah, and even as you were sharing that, it kind of made me think of what's happening with like deep fake videos where those can capture the audio, the video, the, those biometric signature things that are, are unique to an individual and may not be doing it to thousands of different people, but being able to choose from thousands of people which ones you would want to do one of those on. And there's enough video and stuff like that out on YouTube uh, that could be content to start with. Yeah. And speaking of deep fake, that, that topic itself begs its own uh, separate discussion and our discussion, you know, what, what are some of the implications and what kind of technologies. So moving forward, just to conclude the that particular thought is, it is going to be AI versus AI. So bad actors exploiting AI to launch attacks, to create fake profiles, to create fake authentications, to get access to the resources and commit fraud, commit crimes. On the other side, it is the AI again that needs to create a defense mechanisms to, to, to prevent such attacks. So moving forward, uh, I see this being evolved as AI versus AI technologies. And, and this is no different than what is happening today where you have policies, you have different uh, monitoring mechanisms, different uh, uh, network security uh, software tools, uh, but they are, they are becoming more smarter and smarter through AI technologies. Let's take the next question. I think Jim has a question as well. Yeah, uh, Jim had posted that they are assessing an AI-enabled legal contract review uh, SaaS solution. Great, Jim. Uh, I have something to share with you at the end. Uh, please remind me if I forget. That is specifically one topic I will highlight uh, is a very important evolving area in the context of API economy. Awesome. Uh, all of us, as we recognize, APIs are the basic building blocks of software systems moving forward. And there is a particular problem I want to highlight, which is very similar to, Jim, what you are describing. Uh, so Dorothy is saying thank you. That example helped. So great. Thank you, Dorothy, for the question. Okay. So Jim is saying awesome. So I think he's excited to hear about that example. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll share that. Beautiful. All right. Let's move along. Now, you must be wondering, of course, it's not possible for me to summarize all those laws in, in an hour session, perhaps in a day workshop, uh, but uh, I'm going to give some key points, what are going to be the key requirements, and this is not something uh, I made it up, this is something based on the understanding I developed by reading the uh, the executive order in the U.S., the Canadian bill that is being vetted right now, and also the EU AI law. And I can summarize move, uh, the summarize these key points, uh, essentially the requirements moving forward that these uh, the organizations will have uh, 
uh, to put in place to make sure they are compliant are the following. The very first point is organizations must, um, uh, not uh, the, the, whatever te technology they are using must not pose a significant threat to health, safety, and fundamental rights of their citizens. And of course, this is in the context of AI technologies. So let's say if a university is using a AI technology to evaluate the assignments of their students, and let's say if AI messes up, it's violating their fundamental right of getting education, getting evaluated properly. Similarly, if a uh, uh, in Canada, uh, and of course, to some extent in the US, there are a lot of uh, immigrants, there are a lot of talents these countries attract from various uh, other places. And governments use a lot of technologies to evaluate these applications. Simply because you know manpower, the manpower is not there to uh, to process them at the at the speed uh, by which they they should be processed to clear the backlogs. Uh, in in Canada, in particular, the medical uh, uh, line lineup for particular surgery or a, or a particular test, it just it just uh, to a point where uh, it's 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 breaking down the system. And I gave the example of using AI for mammographic tests. So if there are false positives, false negatives, uh, you know, there could be issues. Although organizations that are providing those services or technologies will do everything in their power to make sure that, you know, this doesn't happen. But we all know that. And we must acknowledge, you know, these systems will not be perfect. Like a car that is being sold, even after 100, 200 years of history, Accidents do happen. Mechanical parts do fail. Uh, so AI systems are will no will be will be no exception. So things will happen. And I mean, I'm I'm in no position to teach ISACA colleagues uh, risk management. Risk management is all about you know uh, prioritization. We do, we we are ready. The things will happen. The systems will break down. So are we ready to prioritize? and fix those issues as a, as a business risk. Similarly, organizations must practice risk management that I already touched upon. They need to provide visibility, transparency into their systems. Specifically, uh, this is a small abbreviation, but it's very, very important moving forward, which, which is to say system of record, SARS. And the point is, Dave, this goes back to your question. Uh, many APIs that will empower these applications, and out of those APIs that are integrated in your applications, many of this will be empowered by AI-driven APIs. Take the example of ChatGPT. Let's say you as a company, you have added a, a, a robotic customer experience enhancement using ChatGPT to answer a question and all that. Now, is it happening with the legal service? Is it happening with the financial services? Absolutely, that's good. this will happen. And every time you call an API, you need to record a system, you keep, you have to have a system where all the decisions being made by these AI-driven APIs need to be recorded. There could be millions of calls and going back, auditing those calls when things go wrong is going, going to be an important record from risk management perspective. Providing transparency and also <clears throat> providing a human oversight to these technologies is is also one of the key requirements. So they do not necessarily want a the system independently working without human supervision. I think moving forward, just like uh, CISO, CIOs, I think we are going to have chief AI officer in organizations as well. It's not there. But a lot of organizations perhaps are taking these proactive steps. Maybe there is a law in the future that actually mandates organizations uh, to have a chief AI officer, uh, which is who's responsible for you know all the AI capabilities, having a supervision under their wing, uh, mon uh, monitoring all their systems that are empowered by AI technologies. 
uh, also providing the uh, mechanisms to make sure that these systems are meeting certain accuracy standards. They have cybersecurity principles in place to make sure uh, you know the systems are not compromised. Uh, it's no longer about you hacking a software system, but now it the systems are these systems are more important because in many ways they are making human-like decisions. And uh, protecting those systems is going to be even more important. Last but not least, specifically in the context of EU, one of the requirements they are enforcing is if one of your applications is classified as AI applications, then you must be registered in a publicly available database, which means that uh, any applications that is identified as AI-driven applications, you know, it needs to be known to the public. And then public can decide whether they want to be part of that system or not. That is the public side of things. But of course, if you think from a competition point of view, that is making the system more transparent, but also competitive as well, because now you can see what other companies or what kind of solutions are being, being provided. All right, so to sum this up, I think this is still based on my previous uh, workshop I conducted, Dave, uh, last year with the with the, your chapter. And uh, I shared any of these security issues that we are talking about. You know, if I go back to my previous slides, I talked about, you know, the security uh, authentication authorization problems. But as I highlighted, not every security problem leads to the same business risk. You may have multiple APIs, hundreds and thousands of them. Some of them may be compromised. Some of them may have injection issues. Some of them may be, uh, have authentication issues, but many of those could lead to different kinds of business uh, risks. Uh, so in summary, these risks could translate to either legal risks, financial risks, operational risks, regulatory risks, depending on what do they do? So let me give an example of for financial risk. If your API is transacting, just the credit card information, it's not intelligent enough. But if your API is doing social media analysis, do you have financial impact? Absolutely, you do. Because you as a marketing company or as an analytical company that is providing that service, every tweet that you're integrating in your product has a value, has a dollar value. Similarly, if you were required to launch a product in the EU and they wanted you to disclose all your third-party services that depend on some of these AI capabilities. If you fail to disclose, you may, you may fail to meet some of those requirements and delay the launch or other kinds of issues that may, that may happen. So it's all about building a workflow that will allow us to uh, to to mitigate some of the risk I'm talking about, and in, and an important piece of this is discovery. And discovery has become an important topic, so much so that uh, OWASP has in their 2023 edition of API uh, top risks, they have included inventory management or discovery as one of their top ten problems within their top ten problems. And you can see that many applications are using open source and you're buying companies. These APIs may get into your ecosystem from various dimensions and can pose a risk where you do not even know your APIs, what they are doing. Uh, even within different departments of your organization, you may have certain internal APIs that are doing certain things that your even colleagues may not know. Do this simple exercise. Go ask your team, uh, or even if you have access to your CTO, or you you, you are a CTO or a, in a leadership role, ask this question. Do we know all our APIs across our products and services? And out of those, how many of them are AI-driven APIs? An honest answer will be, oh, we don't actually know. <laughs> Uh, and that is a huge risk where we are sitting at. And uh, so discovery becomes an important piece in that. 
And of course, identifying different technical issues, legal issues, compliance issues. And this becomes an ongoing process. Okay, this is not just a one-time process because APIs may evolve because it's, as Dave, you were, you were highlighting, this is something you did not build, right? Wow. You depended on third parties so they could change it. Their response changed. Uh, it has created a technical problem, which is less, uh, I would say, cumbersome. But if it has started to include a data which had PII or something which which uh, which re which required you to have a more due diligence how that data is being stored, how the authentication is happening. If you're using as a single sign option, using a third party, where are they storing your email IDs or your voice signatures or your uh, biometric other biometrics? Where are they being stored? They are private information, right? So in summary. You need to collect various kinds of analytics to build this process that I'm talking about. Uh, and many times, as you know, auditing is all about providing different analytics to bring visibility into the ecosystem. So finding your inventory, finding what those APIs do, who's providing them, are they old, are they being supported, what exactly do they do? You know, what kind of data comes to them? Uh, do they have any known problems? Uh, and what are the underlying licenses? This is something Jim uh, highlighted, so I will give an example on this, but these are some of the important metrics you wanna collect as part of the process. Once again, this example I already gave that OWASP has uh, you know, included API inventory management as in their top 10 problems. Just finding APIs. If you don't know your APIs, then how do you manage the risk, the underlying risk for those APIs? So now this is time I will give some examples. These are some of the publicly available resources you can access, including us. So this is a repo of thousands of APIs that you have put together. You can educate yourself, understanding those APIs, who are the vendors, what do they do, what kind of data they transact. Uh, we are also collecting some analytics, how secure they are, what kind of authentication, what licenses they provide, Many of those are open, publicly available APIs, but free does not necessarily mean that you don't have obligations. Similarly, there are other uh, vendors through which you can access some of their resources, uh, but they are not necessarily providing security or compliance uh, analytics that I'm talking about. So let's look into some of these examples. I'm gonna stop sharing Dave for a minute and share the link with the with our audience so that they can uh, have this link saved if and when they want to try this out. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Gonna Take me another 30 seconds. Sure. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen again. So the link I was talking about, I'm gonna put it in the chat window. Awesome, thank you. So you can go there to sign up. Um, so you will see a screen like this, the link I shared. If you don't wanna create an account, you can still explore without signing in. But if you want 
uh, some more insights, uh, collecting some more analytics, you can create uh, by pressing the login, you can create an account. The sign off is free. You can use uh, Google or Microsoft, whichever account that you have, uh, you can sign in. Or if you have GitHub, you can sign in using that as well. Already have an account, so I'm just going to sign in. And once you go, the first thing I want to highlight is uh, the different categories of APIs that we have indexed in our community version, which you can uh, see and explore and learn about different API ecosystems. There are thousands and thousands of them. And this will help you enrich your understanding about what kind of innovations that are being created. Uh, I'll give you one quick example. There are APIs that can process images. There are APIs that can filter uh, bad languages, even chat GPT API, which allows you to uh, you know, detect certain abusive language. Uh, in many cases, you do not want to reinvent the wheel. That's where the uh, APIs are very powerful tools. You can embed any third-party services within your application stack uh, that, can, that can bring that feature or function for you. So here in this example, uh, one example I'm going to show here is this particular API essentially, uh, please forgive me for using bad language here, uh, but I'm just wanna uh, you know, highlight a point. The value of this API is it can detect bad or abusive languages within the natural language. And the API that I just ran, let me show you the response of that. So this was my input. And what this API does is it can detect the bad language and replace them with uh, whatever symbols you want. And many applications provide this kind of capability. There are APIs that convert speech to text, but this small demonstration, you get the point. The important point that Jim made was the uh, you know legal analysis. So let me highlight something that is very, very interesting that is evolving in this area. Now, any API that you find out has certain terms of services uh, that you must be compliant with. And they themselves might be referring to certain laws of the land. And the unfortunate state with APIs is, you know, they are not providing a fixed set of licenses, you know, unlike open source where you knew that you have Apache license, MIT license, and you knew how to deal with them, or at least your legal colleagues knew how to deal with them. Not so much with APIs. Uh, I can give you an example of, uh, or even interesting, let's say, um, a Facebook API. So let me give you an example uh, here. So Facebook has you know, various terms of services, platform policies, and all that. Let's say if you end up integrating their APIs, not only you have to be compliant to their SLAs, but also their terms of services because they could change uh, at any point in time. So this is the their today's statement. This is what they are doing right now. So they're asking you what to do, what not to do, and so on and so forth. And you can see that somewhere here, they should have mentioned when they changed it. The difficulty is, if you have one APIs, 10 APIs, you can perhaps manage this manually. But you may have hundreds and thousands, and each of those documents, APIs may have you know, at least two documents, one privacy statement, one API terms of services, and all whatnot. So this is clearly, uh, to point out Jim's problem, you know, uh, you know, you have to use AI or some kind of technology. So let me show you what we are trying to do in this space. So here, uh, I'm going to show you the assessment of their API uh, on the 2017 agreement to make a point. And the point I want to make is these terms of service are evolving and you have to make sure that you are, you are being compliant. So this is the assessment of their 2017 uh, platform policy. You can see that they have certain obligations and one of the obligations they are saying is, uh, do not do not build the same app as Facebook. You know, 
I mean, that makes sense. Why would Facebook give, would give you your their API uh, to build a application that competes with them? Or they would also say, don't build a feature that compete with us or that takes my customers away from my platform. Uh, Facebook actually, uh, if you guys remember, faced a lot of heat back in uh, two, three years ago when Cambridge Analytica incident happened. They were accused that the you know Cambridge Analytica uh, leveraged upon all this data to influence the uh, the U.S. presidential elections, uh, and and you can multiply that problem with all the vendors that are dealing with this kind of issue. You know their data may be exposed in a way that can be uh, misused or manipulated in different ways. So they are they are always evolving their terms of services, what you should do, what you should not do, as highlighted in my case here. But interesting enough, if I do the assessment on their today's agreement, they have dropped all those statements that I was talking about. So here you can see that our system did not detect anything. So my point is, these terms of service are evolving. Now, this is a separate case. Why would they drop certain statements that would actually ask you not to compete with their features? Why would they drop it? So this could be a strategy that they want actually to build those ecosystems and see what you're trying to build and maybe uh, you know just deal with those competition moving forward. So all kinds of issues are there. Uh, so coming back to Jim's question of using AI for legal agreement assessment, this is a, uh, a problem that we are trying to address in an interesting way using our technology that we build which is processing these legal agreements to provide some guidance to the uh, to the uh, to the community members. There are many many such examples, but I encourage you to explore some of these things I highlighted. Look into some of these uh, APIs that are indexed according to industry, according to different uh, uh, you know geographies. Another interesting part is you know many of these APIs might be. Uh, for example, hosted in places where the data might be stored in different countries. For example, if you look at this API, this is being stored in the US by Google, you know, the by Google. You know, this is not Google's API, but of course, I'm sure their services are hosted by GCP. Uh, but at the same time, you can also see some of these other APIs that are hosted uh, in Canada. So if you end up using this off-the-shelf. API integrations within your application. Are you aware where the data is being stored? Uh, if not, of course, if you have a one-to-one -one arrangement with them, then of course they can provide those integrations which are specific to you. But these are some of the highlights I wanted to uh, make. I wanna end with last thought. Hey, we do have one other question. Yes, let's uh, take that, Jim. Yeah. Um... Uh, from Dorothy again, doesn't the EU AI law seem unworkable to include every AI API in a public database? Um, where is that question? I want to read it again. Oh, oh, um, yeah, if you scroll up just a little bit. Um, yes, got it. So this is question by Dorothy, right? Yeah, like at 1.16 p.m. Yeah, so she's saying the EU AI laws seem unworkable to include every AI API in public database. You are perhaps right, Dorothy, but it doesn't really matter to the authorities. At the end of the day, if you are providing a solution then it is your responsibility to disclose or when audited to tell them that if your application is depending or using certain AI capabilities, perhaps delivered through API, which has, which is making decisions based on AI technologies. Okay. They would want that to be disclosed. As a matter of fact, you might have heard about an expression called software bill of materials or SBOMs. The whole idea around SBOM is to make the applications transparent, to disclose, like a, like a food packet, you know, what's, what's included in the food. So that is what governments are demanding moving forward. And uh, yes, there is no publicly 
available database that is specifically listing APIs. But if you are providing a solution that is integrating an API, that is your responsibility to disclose. Now, let me answer the other part. Is there a public repo that is listing all those APIs? Then yes, we that is one of the efforts we have taken where we are trying to index all those APIs at a global scale, like a, like a marketplace, uh, where we can provide these analytics to the community who can benefit from these analytics to see what those APIs are doing and moving forward, also give them thumbs up or thumbs down, or also highlight some of the important aspects of those APIs. So Dorothy, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, and, and, and I think part of that, like you're saying, just to piggyback or at least verbalize, make sure I'm understanding you correctly, is as an organization that's delivering a product or a solution that we, if that's our product, we need to know what APIs we're using and be able to track those. That's part of what we own as um, as our solution. Mm -hmm. Kind of like um, you were describing on the, sorry, kind of like you were describing that in, in the steps of building a, a, a program. Uh, first mm -hmm. thing is identifying what we have. Discovery. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that is, uh, you, you're right. So having the visibility into your ecosystem, understanding the different components of your system is the first step, discovery. And then from there, maybe my categorization is different than your categorization. Maybe you want to index all your solutions, including APIs, according to are these AI related or Maybe you want to categorize them according to different vendors, or maybe you want to categorize them according to different locations where they are being hosted, so that you can you can you can be compliant to the specific laws of the land or right. the use cases that you have specific to the vendors. So there is no one single policy. It really depends on really depends on you know what you are delivering, what it what what is included in those solutions. Uh, and how you're delivering it. Is it going into the cloud or you're shipping the product? Uh, but at the end of the day, discovery is a very, very important piece in all that. No, that's excellent. Thank you. So I think we ran, overran time um, that we were allocated. I'm happy to pause here, or uh, if, uh, if, you, if you want, I can continue for another two minutes or take questions from the audience. I'd say go ahead and take a couple of minutes. I know we went over, but um, I love what you're sharing and uh, appreciate the opportunity to make it available to everyone. But I'd say go ahead and take the couple of minutes because we are at least current with what was what we were receiving from the chat. Yeah, excellent. So I think there are a lot of uh, positive feedback I'm receiving. And um, um, uh, if there are any use cases, perhaps uh, I couldn't cover, maybe we'll look for an opportunity in the future to come back and address some of those questions. Uh, and in, in full honesty, I've just touched the surface of API yeah. economy, AKA API ecosystem. There are a lot of security issues we didn't have time to talk about, a lot of data governance, data sovereignty issues we didn't get a chance to talk about. But these are all great topics. And I think in today's session, at least, I'm I'm glad that I, I was able to talk at the, the high level and talk about the bigger problems uh, from a governance, from a process point of view, and what are the some of the important pieces that we want to put together uh, to address, address that. And what I want to conclude is uh, with this last slide, Basically, uh, I think I forgot to include a summary slide, but this is my contact information. And uh, the link that I provided uh, is gives you access to the, to, to the community version of our platform. And I encourage everybody to uh, get access and uh, make use of those resources. 
And if you have any questions, you are welcome to reach out to us or you can pass that feedback to, uh, to Dave and, uh, and I'm happy to revert back. So with this note, thank you so much, Dave, for inviting us back. Uh, if there are any other questions in the chat window, I can answer. Or um, if somebody wants to unmute and comment or point question, that that's fine as well. Yeah, and, and we are current with everything on the chat. And um, dude, as, as much as I love and appreciate everything you're sharing, um, we should probably start wrapping just because we did go over. Um, but to your point, I did drop your LinkedIn uh, URL in the chat for anybody. Uh, so they had that and uh, we'll be following up if any. So if anybody does have any questions for Dr. Balji, please don't hesitate to reach out directly or if uh, I can help facilitate in any way. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Let me know and uh, hear for you. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you to the audience as well. You guys have a great yeah. rest of the day and great weekend coming ahead. Dude, thank you so much. And uh, thank uh, you. I look forward to talking to you again. And we'll definitely have you back. I appreciate you very much. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thanks. Bye-bye.